Hi, I'm Chika Coleman of Sound On Sight. That's Chuck Kaplinski of the News Gazette and the Illinois Times. And this is Real Reviews of Cinematic Underground, the show where we talk about the latest movies that are in theaters and on DVD. Uh, and today we're going to be discussing three films. Uh, first of which is going to be the film Let's Be Cops. Uh, this film stars Jake Johnson and Damon Wayans Jr. and also the very beautiful Nina Dobrev. It involves two best friends who are approaching 30 or at 30 who have uh, jobs that are dead-end jobs, <laughs> one of which uh, involves uh, the lead character uh, being involved in a herpes commercial and the uh, his best friend and roommate being a fledging game designer? Fledgling? Uh, yeah. He knows his stuff. He's knocking on the door. He just hasn't he's he's gotten the opportunity. He's knocking on the door. He hasn't burst through yet. He at least works at a he works software at it. design company. At least he's there. Mm -hmm. And uh, one night when uh, both of those friends are going to a costume party, they mistakenly dress up as cops, not knowing that the costume party is actually a masquerade party. After uh, Jake Johnson's character realizes that the the party wasn't really for him, um, you know that that it wasn't the best party to go to. Uh, they walk out onto the street and realize people, especially beautiful women, think they're cops, and they embark on a journey to actually live out the fantasy of being fake cops. Uh, unfortunately, they also run afoul of. I don't want to call him a mobster, but I, I guess that's a... Uh, I would say, yeah, a fledgling mobster. Okay, um, a, a low-level mobster uh, gets... Looking a, for a foothold in the community. Looking for a foothold in, in the community gets kind of upended by these two fake cops when they're trying to shake down uh, a local business. And from there, chaos basically reigns. Um, I have a lot of respect for Jake Johnson and Damon Wayans Jr. in uh, their full-time roles as roommates on the television series New Girl. However, for oh, me... Wait, wait, wait. They're both on that show? Yeah, they're both on that show. I didn't realize that. I didn't uh, know Johnson was. I didn't know. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, Damon Wayans Jr. was in the pilot of the first season and wasn't able to come back, I guess, until the third season because okay, he was doing another show, right. Happy Endings. Uh, so these two co stars have finally gotten together to do a movie, and to be truth be told, I was really excited for this movie when I saw the trailer. I thought it was going to be hilarious, but in fact, <coughs> but in fact, it's the opposite. It's it's every corny, stupid joke you could possibly imagine, and only if your brain is completely shut off would you actually be able to really enjoy the comedy that's here. There, there are. Good comedic scenes, though, involving uh, a disturbance in a sorority house where one woman thinks that the other woman is cheating, is um, sleeping, sleeping with her man, sleeping with her man, and there's a big fight that breaks out, and that fight is probably the one hysterical thing that happens in the movie. I really think that Johnson is completely pathetic here. He doesn't really. No, nothing he did really tickled my funny bone. All, all it felt to me uh, like was immaturity and uh, just a, a Peter Pan syndrome. And it was it became annoying and grating after a while. Uh, Damon Wayans Jr., on the other hand, has so many wonderful expressions when things go wrong and reactions to things that Jake Johnson does that he actually makes the film watchable for me. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, his character is the best character in the film. I would just say that he is the, the glue that holds the film together. And uh, Nina Dobrev, uh, just stunning. Just, she can do whatever once. Yeah, I, I don't... Just stand there, it's fine. Yeah, just stay in there and <laughs> smile, it's fine. We will watch you endlessly. Chuck, what did you think of Let's Be Cops? I enjoyed it. I, I had no expectations at all, so maybe that's part of the uh, different approach we have to it. I, I had no expectations. I knew very little about it. Um, I hadn't even seen a preview. Uh, and so I think with that, going in with that, I was willing to be entertained and surprised. Uh, it's, you know, it's, I, I'm not defending the film. I'm not necessarily saying it was good, but I had fun. 
uh, it's a, I look at it as a low rent or a B grade or a B movie version of 21 Jump Street is what I, what I see there. Um, and the Wayans kid, he really surprised me because I don't like his father, I don't like his uncles, whatever it is. They always try a little bit too much for me. He, though, kind of tones it down a little bit. He's not as out in your face. And I think that makes him much more effective. I think he's great because he, as an actor, is a reactor. He, right. do he doesn't just try to make funny things out of thin air. He says, oh, this happened to me, so I'm going to react like this. He's a very effective second banana. Because, yeah, his right, his, he, he is to react. And I'll take exception to one thing you said. I think the funniest thing was the hardware store. Oh, yeah. Where they have to arrest the obese naked guy. That, to <laughs> me, was the funniest thing. <laughs> I was a bad father. I took my 10-year-old to see this with me. Uh, and we laughed and laughed and laughed at that thing. And we may even rent it just to look at that scene and <laughs> go back and forth and back and forth. And you know what I'm talking about. Uh, like I say, I can't defend the film. Uh, but I had fun. And, and that's all I really can say about it. And I didn't, Johnson didn't bother me too much. Okay. Because I guess eventually his character figures out, oh, I'm in over my head. I have to stop this. And yeah. they do attempt to do the right thing. They do attempt to do the right thing, and it's good. And Rob Riggle has a great Rob Riggle. Yeah, I was just going to say, and he's not role. his usual goofy. He's a straight man. Yeah, he's and actually the straight him, guy. Though. That's for a the change. shocking thing. Uh, you really believe his performance as a straight man. Yeah, yeah, you know, those comedians, they can do anything. Yeah, I mean, I mean really, they, they can. They're mm -hmm. ultimately chameleons that, that I, I would love to see more performances like this from Riggle. Well, you, you will, I think. You know, as these comedians get older, uh, you know, they eventually, you know, branch out. And it's, all, it's not about whether they can do it. It's about whether we can accept them. You know, we, we've got to broaden our minds a little bit and not, you know, pigeonhole people in roles that we become accustomed to seeing them in. Uh, so, yeah, I'm hoping to see him do more stuff like that, too. Do you, do you hope that uh, Johnson and Wayne's routine for another time? You know, time? and I actually said that in my review. I would like to see them again with a better script. You know, yeah. I, I think that there's something there. Their chemistry for me there really helped. There is, especially, like, the only other scene that made me laugh is the whole uh, beginning Backstreet Boys, I Want It That Way karaoke. I was yeah, just like, yeah. oh, that's cheesy and fun. I'll, I'll ride with you on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Definitely a renter or if you're up renter, late at night like, it's a, and it's, it's there. It's a two-star <laughs> film. You know, you're not going to remember it in T-minus, like, a day, but it, it, it's solid enough to where if you can you can handle that hardware store scene and you can handle the sororities that you're fighting, then you'll enjoy it. And the, uh, the girls in it. Oh, God, yeah, Nino Dobro. Yeah. That's the other reason. I didn't really know much about her, and I looked her up, and I think I need to start watching that vampire film. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the second film that I want to talk about today is one that I hadn't really been anticipating, but I was interested in. And that's uh, the Chloe Grace Moretz film, If I Stay. And let me guess, the only reason you were interested in it was because she's in it. Yeah. And me too, and it's because she's talented. Yeah, she's I talented. I really enjoy her. Yeah. And, and the film very much reminds me of a film that came out, I want to say, seven years ago called Invincible, written by da David S. Goyer. Refresh my memory. Oh, God. It, it, it's, it's an older we film. We don't get internet here, remember? We're at the city building. You know, <laughs> Yo, internet yeah. sucks. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I <laughs> Thanks, should put Urbana. That, yeah. Um, <laughs> so you can edit that out. Basically, <laughs> basically, the plot of this film is that Moretz plays an award-winning or close to award-winning cellist. Well, now you got me curious about Invincible. I'm going to try anyway. Talk about the movie. And um, she is just a fantastic player. She has yeah. an, a boyfriend that she recently broke up with and that's kind of affecting her playing and she's in the car with her family and there's a car crash and she ends up in a coma and she, she ends up having an out-of-body experience literally and she's basically walking through the hospital remembering things about her life uh, as you know doctors try to fight to save her life and she's remembering how she fell in love with the boy she fell in love with and her family and all all these different little small aspects of her life and deciding is it worth it to stay and try and live this out or should I go to the other side um, and I'm gonna tell you what this reminded me of if a movie I can't find if Twilight was a ghost movie oh. 
A Twilight? The Invisible, not Invincible. Oh, The, the Invisible. The I'm invisible. sorry. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Reminds mm -hmm. me a lot of that film. Okay. Um, and um, I really... The only thing that saves this film is two performances, actually. I don't know if you've seen this film. Yeah, I've seen it. Okay. The two performances that save this film are Chloe Grace Moretz and Stacy Keach is her grandfather. Uh, I love Chloe Grace Moretz in this film because she shows a lot of that fear that was resemblant in Carrie, fear of, of, of the unknown, fear of being accepted, fear of being understood, yeah, okay. especially with the loss of her family, that little tiny spoiler, her entire family is yeah. <laughs> kind of gone. They all die. Yeah. <laughs> um, so watching her live out those experiences was g interesting for me. I enjoyed learning about her relationship. Didn't really feel twilighty. Felt kind of normal, average, everyday relationship. And the conversation Stacy Keach as her grandfather had with her about why she should stay or go or whether it was okay for her to stay or go grounded the film for me. Uh, ultimately, if you're a teen, you know exactly where the ending of this film was headed. But because... Uh, Grace Moretz had such a grounded performance. It made me enjoy the film. I, I I can't really say more than that. Chuck, what did you think of it? I didn't like this movie at all. Okay. Uh, even even I thought even she gave a bad performance, uh, and I think it was only due partly to her, but also because I don't think there was a strong director there to guide her. I thought there were a lot of very obvious uh, reactions on her part. Uh, what do I do? Huh? And she was given no uh, help with the script that required her to state very obvious things at times, like, what do I do now? And, oh, I was looking at that. And, oh, I mean, the script I thought was pretty shoddy. Uh, I thought Keach was very good. He was the saving grace for the few moments he was there. But I just, you know, look, this was based on a book, a young adult book. This book was pitched to teenage girls. This movie is pitch to teenage girls. I am not a teenage girl, so it's not for me. Mm -hmm. The thing I had a problem with is that, you know, when you're a teenager, every single thing that happens is the end of the world. Yeah. It's incredibly melodramatic. Oh my God. Oh, what am I going to do? And that was the tone of this film. And I, to me, it was exhausting. Uh, and also, I, it just was, you know, she had the parents who were just, oh, we're the cool parents. Yeah. And, because and we're then we rockers. have the boyfriend who's, yeah, I'm the cool rocker boyfriend. And, you know, it was like they weren't people to me. They were playing types. They were types and tropes. They were yeah. types, you know, so I couldn't buy into that. And it's just, I, I, it just felt to me like a huge time waster and a waste of her talent. I excuse that because of the isolation she must have felt in, in those instances of, you know, trying to piece together her life and what she wanted for herself. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where that came in for me. That, that's where, where I bought in. But other than that, I would say this is ghost for teens. I never bought in, and I kept thinking, well, what if I don't stay? <laughs> <laughs> that is clever. Yeah. That, that, that's really clever. I like that. Yeah. Um, so... We were on opposite sides of this film, but that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, the third film that I want to talk about today, and I want you to take this one because I've taken the first two, mm -hmm. uh, The Expendables. Can you tell the audience what that film was about? Old uh, guys blowing three. up crap. There you go. It's right there. <laughs> uh, same old, same old. Uh, you know what? Well, we'll talk about this. Sylvester Stallone, another action epic with the... Uh, Old action heroes, this time, uh, though it's personal, uh, <laughs> because the bad guy is played by Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson, we find out his character, uh, used to be an expendable, that he started the expendables, expendables with the Stallone character, uh, but they had a falling out, and he has gone out on his own and has become a arms dealer, which I think is the um, standard bad guy role these days. On an international scale, you're a bad arms dealer. Um, uh, the uh, Stallone's group tries to stop him at one point earlier in the film. It does not go well. Uh, so basically, Stallone tells the old guys, who include uh, Jason Statham, uh, Dolph Lundgren, uh, Terry Crews, and the wrestler guy, who I can't remember, uh, that they're too old, puts them out to pasture. He does not want to be 
responsible for them, and so he recruits some new younger uh, expendables to go back and get some revenge on the Gibson character, but it doesn't work out too well that time. Uh, Harrison Ford is on board this time, taking over uh, the role, not the exact role, but the function of Bruce Willis, who apparently wanted too much money. Uh, Harrison Ford is there. He's the CIA operative who helps give them information and helps them out as well. And Schwarzenegger is back as well. He's got a little bit of a bigger role. Um, and uh, if you're a Jet Li fan, you're going to blink and you'll probably miss him. I don't even know why they bothered to bring him back. Uh, probably just they so they did the same throw, thing in the second one, too. Probably, well, his role was huge in the second one compared to this. I think they just brought him back so they could throw his name on the poster and maybe the film would play best in Asian markets to see that name there. But uh, he's there and he's gone. Um, the movie is what you expect. I mean, there are no surprises. You get what you pay for. I will say one thing, though. Um, it, 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 at moments, this movie proves that a talented actor can help elevate and can improve shoddy material. Uh, the scenes where, with Ford in, in them, he shows you why he is the professional that he is. You can see Stallone upping his game during their conversations. Uh, Ford just, I, I'm sure he doesn't even think about it anymore. He just made, brings a natural gravity to everything that he does. And I enjoyed those scenes. And Gibson as well. I think he was the best bad guy they've had so far. He's got a great scene in which he explains his background and uh, points out that the difference between him and the Stallone character, there's really not much of a difference. And that, I thought, was a key moment in the film. So, uh, you know, more of the same, but again, it was good to see those familiar faces. Okay, so... Oh, uh, and I forgot Wesley Snipes. You can talk uh, about him. Uh, yeah, I was gonna, that was where I was going to go. What, what did you think of Wesley Snipes? Well, I think Wesley Snipes obviously is thrilled to death that he's in the movie again uh, that people are going to see, and that goes straight to video again. He's so happy that he has no problems making fun of his own situation. Yeah. Uh, Snipes was away in jail for tax evasion. Uh, the opening sequence has uh, the Stallone crew breaking him out of a prison train. Apparently, he was also a member of their group, uh, and when they ask him what he was going to jail for, he jokingly says, tax, tax evasion. <laughs> so, uh, it was good to see him again. I didn't mind uh, that. Yeah. Um, my whole experience with The Expendables is grounded in the fact that I, I liked Stallone after Rocky Balboa. I thought that was a great film ba way back in 2006. And when I heard he was going to gather together all these action stars, I was like, oh, yes, this will be great. First one, fine, great, acceptable. You, you, you had a good balance for that. Second one, great villain, horrible story, not enough, you know, action and character moments. Third one, we have basically the same problem. Great villain, not enough action and character moments. And when they add in the new younger crew, it makes no sense. You're, you're bucking, the, you're, you're, you're jumping the shark in your own movie. It's about old guys who are coming in to get the job done one last time. And instead you bring in a new group halfway through the movie? That doesn't work for me. You're, 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 you're killing your own tagline. I, I don't understand a lot about this film. I understand that Gibson had a grudge with Stallone in this film. I understand that, you know, they had history, quote unquote. What I don't get is why is that supposed to matter? Like, g give me a more palpable reason for the villain to hate the hero. You, you didn't give me that in this film. Um, I'll tell you one character that really annoyed me. Uh, Antonio Banderas' character. Oh, I forgot about him, too. Yeah. That really, just grating on my system. It was like watching Antonio Banderas on a, a drug we commonly call speed. I kind of liked him, actually. A lot of people Just for the do. comic, rea I, the comic I, relief, I, I thought he was fine. I want you to explain that to me. Why do you like him? You mean in the film or in, in the general? Film. I, I thought he was good comic relief. I mean, I think that uh, if these films have a problem at times is that they take themselves too seriously. And he was there, and just the reactions of the other guys were you know, like, well, you shut up. I mean, look, again, it's not something I could really defend, but you know, for what it was, he was at least a nice relief uh, to, to everything else that was going on, but nothing great, you know. Okay, I'll give you that. I mean, uh, he did provide me some interesting moments of levity when he did show up for the first time, but when he kept repeatedly trying to, you know, hit on one of the Expendables who's female and also 
wisecrack while well, trying to shoot bad guys. It didn't work for me. It didn't feel honest. If you'd given him a sword and asked him to do the same thing, I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm in this full run. But gunplay him, no. I mean, I've seen Berserker vs. Seven or whatever the heck that movie was that everybody forgot about with Lucy Liu. He's not an action star, really, unless you're talking about Zorro. Well, not Desperado. Or Desperado. That's how he burst on the scene. Desperado, or, or, or man. Desperado. Or um, what's the other movie he did with Tarantino? Or, crap, what was that movie? Desperado. Oh, no, no that was Rodriguez. The Vampire. Uh, Dust Till Dawn. Dust Till Dawn. Uh, he wasn't the, in that. Wasn't he? No, that was Clooney and Tarantino. Clooney and Tarantino, but didn't it, Banderas have a, I'm sure Banderas had a cameo in that. Keep talking. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I, the, the film didn't really work for me. I don't, I, it just didn't have that palpable action intensity. I mean, even when something bad happens to one of the lead expendables, I wasn't shocked. Well, but that's the whole thing. They're not expendable. None of them ever die. Yeah, I know. You know, that's the other thing, too. But, you know, again, I, I, I understand your objections, but there's really no sense to get upset about it because this is not high art. I mean, and then and, and there's never any pretension that it is. It, this is disposable entertainment. Disposable nothing, crap that we can use as much more. as we want. It hasn't done well at the box office, so I think I got the win anyway. And what do you think? I mean, they're saying that perhaps that is due to the leak. No. Uh, do you think that's the case or not? I think it's just sequel burnout. You're thinking, oh no, this was a Rodriguez film too, Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Oh yeah, that's the one I was thinking. I mean, come on, the guy has made enough action films that he, he belongs. I have no problem with that. Uh, but yeah, and I would Puss in the, Boots. Yeah, I no. would say that this film is dead due to sequel burnout. Well, it's interesting because I know that, um, and I read this just yesterday, that they want to do the female spinoff, the Expendables. Which I think could be really interesting if you get Pam Anderson. Well, uh, they approached Sigourney Weaver about being the leader of that crew, and she, uh, she's not going to be in it. She denied that. Uh, it could be fun. But again, yeah. it's not something you can be overly critical of because it's, you know, it's crap from the beginning. Uh, there are a couple people I want in this film. Pam Anderson, Jane Fonda, and... Jane Fonda? Why Jane Fonda? Oh, come she's on. She's never an action star. Wasn't she Tank Girl? I believe she was Tank Girl. Lori Petty was Tank Girl. Lori Petty was Tank Girl. Jane she, Fonda was Barbarella all Bar the way back in the 60s. And we, that, that, uh, no, we're past our sell-by date on that Okay, one. fine. How about Pam Greer? Okay, that I would say yes to. Uh, Pam Greer, you could almost get Holly Berry at this point in The Expendables. Mm. Um, and I think that would be it for the, the movie. Gina Carano. Oh, oh, well, Gina, of course. That, that, and the one expendable we had in this movie that was you know, get her. Well, you, there, there's your transition too. That's how you could connect these things. You know, have that character be the crossover. Ooh, you could have you know. uh, Linda. Oh. Well, who's the girl? Uh, uh, Linda, Linda Hamilton. Linda Hamilton. She could be the leader. Yeah. That would be completely believable. That would be good. Uh, and who's the young lady, uh, gorgeous girl, uh, in the uh, Resident Evil films? Oh, Mila Jovovich. Yeah. Yes. She's got to be there. She's got to be there, yeah. or else. I, I, I agree. Um, there ballistic one, X versus Sever. Yeah, Ballistic X versus yeah, Sever. Yeah. Um, there is one more film I want to talk about. We have five minutes left. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, and you forgot Assassins, which he did make with Stallone. That's why uh, he's there. Oh, well, there we go. Um, the last one I want to talk to you about today is Sin City. Not Sin City, Dame to Kill for Sin City, because there are people out here who were born after that film was released. So what do you think about Frank Miller's Sin City? It came out, what, 2006, I think? 2005, 2006. I think it was 2005, because it was been nine years. Uh, I thought it was visually incredible. I mean, it was a visually incredibly dynamic film. Uh, at the time, it was far ahead of its time. Uh, obviously, other filmmakers and other techniques have caught up to it. Um, it was. I had the same problem with Sin City that I had with 300. Uh, visually arresting, uh, the story didn't do much of anything for me. The, the short stories really didn't matter to me at all. Either I liked Hardigan, uh Willis's character. It I was. Want, it was I all an excuse for full, style. Yeah, I wanted to see a full movie with that character or Marv, but when you broke it down into little shorts, nothing really connected. Well, and I have not seen Sin City 2, but uh, apparently it's the same structure, and apparently there is a connection or two back to the first film. Uh, I think, again, I haven't seen it, 
but I think this film is really going to have a hard time because of the gap, just the you know, nine the, years going by bet between following up. Had it been two or three, I'd be able to understand and the fan right. base would still be there, but I really don't understand why they would do it now. Yeah, yeah. technologically, I don't know if it's going to be the revelation it was before, and who's going to be remembering any sort of plot threads unless you've gone back to watch it. Oh, although, I do have to say, it did really have a very uh, loyal core uh, following that first film. I mean, it did have people who loved it, and I mean, they really did love it, so and I think this is for them. And I think two or three actors from the original film are, are, have passed on, Michael Clark Duncan being one of them. Uh, Brittany Murphy. Brittany Murphy being another, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not going to have that same, I'm not going to have that same love for it as I did before, I don't think, if I try and choose to go see it. But there is one upside to this film, the ultimate film fatale of the modern era is in this film. Eva Green is in this film. And when I would not have said she is the ultimate film fatale unless I had seen earlier this year uh, 300 Rise of an Empire. Yeah. There she, boy, you don't mess with her. Yeah, you don't really mess with her. No, no. You can fight and make up with her in the same <laughs> scene. And you'll never be the same. <laughs> you'll never be the same after it either. Um, you know, real quick, you always ask me what am I looking forward to, and yeah. you usually stump me, and I'm like, yeah. oh, What are you looking forward to? I am to? looking forward to There's a film that was set to release November. They've moved it up to October. I hope that means that the studio is confident, and that is Fury, a World War II film with Brad Pitt, directed and written by the guy who did End of Watch two years ago. Ooh. World War II film, it's about a tank crew, Pitt is the leader. They have a new guy who's being thrown into it, Logan Lehrman from the Percy Jackson films. The rest of the crew, three guys, Michael Pena from uh, End of Watch, John uh, Barenthal from The Walking Ooh. Dead, and uh, Shia LaBeouf, hopefully a oh resurrection God. for him. Uh, can't wait for this one. I'm not even confident with that. I would say that the one... Shia LaBeouf is a good actor. You've got to distance yourself from the personal crap he's going through. You've got to admit... He was good in Infomaniac. Oh, yeah, he was great. I, I liked the accent, and it felt real unbelievable gotta, to me. you got to distance the personal stuff from what he does on, on screen. I can't say that there's one specific film I'm looking forward to, actually. Um, let's see. if I'm, Give me some ideas of what's coming. <laughs> Because uh, I know that <laughs> I know there's something. It's just on the tip of my there's tongue. something. Boy, it's so memorable. I, 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 I'm looking forward to it so much. Uh, again, I'm looking forward to Fury. Uh, uh, Angelina Jolie's film. Oh yeah, that uh, because I know the actor. Unbreak, it, unbroken. Um, what else? What else? What else? Gone Girl, the Ben Affleck, David Fincher thing. Gone Girl looks amazing. Out. I want to see that. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you know, and um, you know, it's 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 going to be, you know, crunch time here pretty soon. I'm also looking to, uh, forward to Clint Eastwood's film. It's been moved up to Christmas Day, American Sniper uh, with Bradley Cooper. Oh yes, that biopic of that the, Chris... Um, yeah, the guy who killed more people during the Iraqi war than anyone. So, yeah. you know, hey, this is the time we look forward to, November, December, so good stuff. Hopefully we just got to get through September. Uh, Oscar season is upon us. Not quite, but, you know. You're getting close though. Um, I'm excited for the Emmy Sunday night, I will tell you that, because I want Breaking Bad to get that final Emmy for Best Drama, and I want Brian Cranston to get his Emmy for Walter White tomorrow on Sunday. Okay. Uh, but until then, I'm Chike Coleman from Sound On Sight. That's Chuck Kaplinski from the Illinois Times and the News Gazette. Make sure to check out his work and mine, and we will see you next week.